except I have to say something first because it's the only important thing I really wanted to say. In one of the briefs, and she's going to do much more of this because she knows a lot more about potential history. <laughs> the most important thing to remember this case is that in one of the briefs, well, obviously, the losing sides brief, um, they referred to Varsity's vast empire of pet. And that, I think, is the most important legal thing to take away from the panel, the vast empire of pet. What is that? I really am afraid to find out too closely because I'm, I'm envisioning cheerleaders and their mothers, and I get frightened. Pom poms. Cheerleaders in like stormtrooper helmets. That's understandably terrifying. The vast <laughs> empire of pet, because I, apparently the guys who won are the dark side. I absolutely should have done that as cosplay. If there would have yes. been like four people at this con who would have gotten the joke. Damn. Okay. Well. Yeah, and two of them are sitting here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just would have been this panel. But we would have thought. All right, it was ne great. next year, vast empire had All right, Keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> okay, put them so on business cards. <laughs> I guess we'll get started. Um, so this is the cosplay Supreme Court case panel. Uh, that is in fact a thing. Those are words you probably never thought you would see together, but here we are. Um, so just quick introductions. Uh, I'm Meredith Rose. I work uh, at a DC-based consumer advocacy group called Public Knowledge. Um, you may have seen me, this is my last panel. Uh, I was on the Net Neutrality panel and then uh, Internet Connected Sex Toys panel. Uh, which, yeah. was, which was, yeah, quite quite a trip. Um, yeah. And I work a lot on uh, telecom issues, but mostly intellectual property, copyright, and sort of my pet project is how those interact with fandom and fan practices. So this is like smack in the middle of my wheelhouse. I'm Courtney Lytle. I'm an attorney here in Atlanta. I, I'm part-time. Okay, I'm not standing up, so I can't actually hear Sorry, I'm not used to using the mic. I'm, I'm an attorney here in Atlanta. I have um, just a small consulting practice at this point. I used to do the big firm thing. I don't now. And I teach part-time at Emory and do some IP classes as well as some negotiations classes and some corporate stuff. So my teaching actually is the same as my practice. Some corporate stuff, some small entrepreneurship things, and a fair amount of copyright and IP work. I used to do ginormous M&A work, but once you leave the big firm, it's hard to keep the ginormous clients, nor would you want to. Um, so I think I get the academic piece out of the case, which is my wheelhouse. <laughs> and my name's TJ Myhill. I'm, I'm an attorney here in Atlanta, too. You guys see me on other panels, but I didn't get any fun ones like Internet Connected Sex Toys. Aww. But I've had several other panels this weekend, so some of you might have seen me. Uh, I practice in business intellectual property, primarily litigation. So, whereas Courtney handles the paperwork end, I handle the suing people end. And, uh, I try to put his people <laughs> out of business by making there be no conflicts in the world. His people are doing just fine. My people do just fine. <laughs> I, I make up for it by sniping at litigators in most of my panels, and since I'm the only one on my other panels, because no one actually likes to play with me, um, I can say it, no one else in the front of the room can argue with me when I talk about how his people are ruining the world. I mentioned him. Oh, no, we are. In one of my earlier. <laughs> well, and then I, I get to go up to Congress and explain how all these people are ruining the world. <laughs> That's my job. So, yeah, I thought we'd start a little bit about background, what the case is, um, and then kind of get into the legal weeds. So, as a preface, um, this has to deal with a. This, the whole case really hinges on this very core yet very obscure copyright doctrine, which Courtney is going to explain uh, more confidently than I can. Uh, but it's the, obscure and no one cares. Yes! <laughs> but yeah, academics make their career awesome. off of arguing about this, because uh, there's, the, the short version is there's no good answer uh, in most cases. No, they're not. But, uh, so the background on this case is the two parties are Varsity Brands, the Empire of Pep, uh, and vast Star Athletic. The Vast Empire of Pep. Yeah, that's right. The Vast Empire of Pep. Um, <laughs> So, Varsity Brands is a company that manufactures patterns for cheerleading uniforms. If you have ever been involved in competitive cheer, which is a thing I was unaware of until very recently, uh, you have dealt with Varsity Brands. They are essentially a monopoly for all intents and purposes. They are the vast empire of PEP. Uh, they sponsor almost all of the official cheerleading competitions, um, got their name on everything. They have bought up or bullied out any other competitor in the market over the last couple of decades. Uh, so obviously this creates an interesting, you know, uh, this creates a vacuum where all of a sudden you have folks who, if you want to do competitive cheer, you have to pay money to Varsity so they get monopoly pricing on all of their stuff. Um, and so you get like a little upstart like Star Athletica, which comes in and starts selling patterns for cheerleading uniforms. 
Now, if you think about a cheerleading uniform, there's kind of only so many elements that go into a cheerleading uniform. Like, first off, you start with essentially what is a tennis dress. Like, if you just think about the shape and the pleating, it's just a, you start with like a blank tennis dress. And on top of that, you get some color blocks, some chevron, some stripes, maybe a couple of letters here or there. Like, maybe you can slap on a mask up, but it's a very limited number of elements in a very limited number of colors. Uh, and if you think about, if you're cheering for, so like my high school uh, mascot, Middletown High School South, go Tigers, um, they had, it was blue and silver. That was our mascot colors. And if you are already on a team, and the team has bought a design from Varsity, and you don't really have the money to pay for a Varsity suit, you'd have to go over and get something that looks pretty similar in order to compete on the, like, to be on the team from a different company. So the background on that, uh, Varsity for a long time before this lawsuit started, had been essentially trying to brute force the copyright office into giving them a copyright on their cheerleading uniforms. <laughs> now, for reasons that Courtney's going to explain, you can't get a copyright in a piece of clothing. Uh, there's a long history in how we think about things, and it is exceptionally difficult to get a copyright in a piece of clothing. Now, this did not deter Varsity. Uh, Varsity, for several years, kept sending in its designs asking for copyrights. And every single time, the copyright office was like, no. No, please go away, no. Um, and eventually, they sent in a drawing of one of their designs, and the copyright office said, if it will make you go away, we will give you, we will register for copyright the picture that you sent us, the drawing that you just sent us, just the drawing. And they made it very clear, like, just that drawing, we will register for copyrights, thinking this would maybe solve the problem. It did not. <laughs> Ron Howard voice, it didn't. Um, give them an inch. And they just yeah. keep going. Take them, that's what we do. Um, and so Varsity proceeded to see this little upstart star athletic come around and say, hey, those designs look an awful lot like our designs. Uh, that's copyright infringement. And they took them to court. Uh, now, when you kind of get up into the upper echelons, because this whole, the underlying copyright question about the separability, like when, when is something functional, when is something decorative, basically, um, it's such a hard question that when you get up to the circuit court level, there were, I think, like six or seven separate courts that had like ten different tests for it. Um, there were more tests than there were circuit courts. It was that bad. Uh, and no one had a good answer. And the Supreme Court abhors a circuit split. Uh, and so they took it and they tr basically came up with an eleventh test. That was their way of settling the waters. They came up with a brand new test which, you know, officially nuked all of the other ones. Um, but it's a test that doesn't make any more sense than any of the other previous 10. So that's kind of where we stand right now. Um, and we're still kind of sussing out the implications of it. The decision just came out in March-ish. Um, I was on maternity at least, so sometime between February and April. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of where we are now and how we got there. We actually did a panel on this last year uh, yeah. while it was still being argued. So this is a little bit of an update. <clears throat> Yay, updates. Um, so academic time? Yeah. Go oh, great. Right. Yay! I'm, in, I'm sorry guys, you may have set the camera up differently. I have to walk if I'm going to talk, otherwise I will mumble and not remember what I'm trying to say. Pick up the mic then. Yeah. I'll turn that around to where I am. We're going we're gonna to sork in this? Walk and talk? Hey, I got it. I can't sit still and do this. It's Monday. Seriously, yeah. I can't sit and talk. Okay. Separability is really, really exciting. My students love this stuff. Um, every now and again, if I teach a doctrinal course, maybe just copyright law, with a big old scary three-hour exam at the end of it, and the nice thing about law school <laughs> is um, some classes, and indeed traditional classes, you get no grades at all during the semester. Three-hour exam, that's your grade. Good luck. Um, I used to make a point of going out and doing something fun the night before the exam because it was that much, well, it's weird because I'm old and boring, but it was also kind of exciting. I knew my students were wretchedly, miserably studying for the exam. Of course, then they would turn in the exams and they were done. I had to grade the things, but I had more fun at their expense the night before because law school exams suck. Sometimes when I teach copyright, I actually insist that they learn all 18 stupid separability tests. Um, I, just when I'm feeling really mean, because there's honestly no point whatsoever. They are all exactly the same. They just have different names and different judges and professors wrote them. They are all the same. The basic idea we work on, though, is, okay, copyright is about art. 
It's about creative things. It's about design. If you have something functional, the copyright people do not want to talk to you. It's called a useful item, which is a subset of pictorial, graphic, and sculptural arts. And we don't have to go there because this is not actually my copyright class. Ha -ha. So basically, what you guys need to know is copyright's not going to cover it if it has an actual does something kind of purpose. It's only going to cover it if it's arty and creative. So all the form, none of the function. OK, that sounds simple as a rule, right? Nope. No. Well, it even might have been, except, you know, we are the people who then get hired by opposing people. They are. I just don't get hired by anyone that is actually going to go to trial. You get hired by the American people? There you go. It's all his okay, fault. Exactly. It's all his it's fault. Legit. His people but don't worry, argue find a way what to tell you sounds works. perfectly clear and make it obscure. <laughs> but actually, i got to confess, some of it comes from my people who have to write about things that no one cares about to get tenure. So we call it, and then we get quoted by his people trying to convince judges. Um, but that's okay, too. All we're really trying to do is figure out if I have something that is designed in a way that's pretty and has a function, how do I separate out which part would be copyrightable? Because Congress and the old cases on which Congress based the law basically said, well, just because it has function shouldn't mean it can't be copyrighted if there's enough design there. But we're not going to give you any protection in the functional bit. So I even brought a spoke. We'll start with the easiest one. So this is a coin purse. And you can carry it on your shoulder. And this was intended for someone a fraction of my age, and I own it anyway. No judging. I'm sorry, it's dragging on. <laughs> you can put your ID and your room key in this. OK, this is a purse. But it looks like a pony. And it's got colorful fabric. This is the kind of thing the tests were made for. If I made something without the zipper and the strap that was just a fabric sculpture of a pony, I can copyright it. I mean, no one's going to care that I've copyrighted it, but I can. I can have a copyright in this fabric sculptural work of a pony. Woohoo. Now, I can't keep other people from making sculptural soft works of ponies. That's the idea. The idea is a pony. I can't own that. I can own this exact one. Really, when you get down to something like a pony purse, um, the only thing I'm really going to own as my copyright is this one. You can't copy it exactly. Anyone else who wants to can make a soft sculpture of a pony. OK, I made this one a purse, because that way I can sell it for more money than it's worth in little beach gift shops, and stupid people buy them. Um, <laughs> Now, I don't own the idea of a pony purse. Someone else can make the pony purse. Assuming I get this copyrighted, someone else can still make a purse out of a pony. Well, please don't make a purse out of a pony. A purse that looks like a pony. That was your <laughs> so, this is, so that's where kind of the practical and design part come out. I may own this exact design, and you can't copy it, but you can make your own zippered pony purse and sell it to people who have sunstroke and aren't paying attention to what they buy. Except I still have it. I still, I don't use it, of course not. That would be ridiculous. Okay, but looking at this, so we can all kind of get that. And you all now have a pretty good understanding of what of my pony purse is copyrighted and what isn't, right? Okay, I don't think they actually bother to file, but just by fixing it in a tangible medium. This is my earlier panel. Um, you get the copyright. Okay, you guys kind of have a pretty good understanding, right? Okay, now explain it in really big words. But really, but different really big words to make you sound like a really smart judge. And you don't want to really say what the guys from the other circuit said because you're way smarter than them. <laughs> and if you're a professor, you sure can't make a rule just like someone else's rule because you know you're way smarter than them and you're still hoping for tenure. So you have lots of different people with lots of big words trying to explain in a way that makes them not sound like a moron on Monday morning of Dragon Con. But I just explained to you this concept. Everyone's got it. That wasn't hard. I can make it really hard if I try to pretend there's a significant difference between each of the tests. One of them will be physical separability. Can I separate physically the pony from the purse? No, no, no not really. The pony is the purse. The classic case that all of us like to talk about um, is a, 
a really ugly lamp that is now famous among copyright lawyers. And with, <laughs> Which I talked about on the Dragon Connerly show yesterday morning. Uh, it's a Balinese dancer, a specifically Balinese dancer, if I recall correctly, in a lamp post. Um, so you get your living room lamp with a tiki dancer on it. I think I'm going to stick with pony first. Um, but the question was, can they copyright that lamp? And the answer was, well, no, not the lamp, but there's this statue in the middle of it. And then we can even get into arguments over, does it matter if the statue is just part of, is just you know, attached to the base? Well, in physical separability, it's easy. Break the damn thing off. Look, I've got a statue. Look, I can copyright it. But the lamp is not. But then we get to worry about, what if the sculpture is in the base of the lamp and actually kind of holding up the light bulb? Well, I can't separate it and leave a lamp behind. But we never really worried about that particular aspect of it much until the new test. Now it matters. Um, but now we can think about it because now I say, oh, we don't care anymore. You can just leave scraps of wire and it's still okay. Regardless, if you can break it off easily, that's, sep that's physical separability. That's the easy one. That is um, the <coughs> leaping Jaguar on the front of the Jaguar automobile. That's easy. I can physically separate it. And I understand that's a thing if you drive your Jaguar downtown. People do physically separate that statue off the front of your car. So those are the easy cases. The rest of them are all conceptual separability. Can I conceive of a way to separate the form from the function? <laughs> this is where, uh, seriously, some of this is my people, because we can go on for days about things that really don't matter at all. Um, and some of it is, well, if I, some of it is how you first look at it. If I see this item, do I see a chair or do I see a work of art? And then I go sit on it before the guards tell me not to because it's a work of art. Um, or does it give the first impression of a chair? Can I conceive of a way to separate the <coughs> art without destroying the underlying function? If I, you know, and there's all kinds of different ways to talk about conceptual separability. In fact, at last count, I think there were 11, and all of them said the same thing. What do you think? Is this really form or is this really function? Only the form parts are protected. Sometimes you really can't separate it, especially after this opinion, this may be the only thing that's ever denied, is y'all have seen the bike racks out in every city in the world that are kind of the curvy little bike racks? Yeah. There was a copyright case about those. Um, and they said, no, it's a sculpture. We The first guy that made those um, said, look, look, I can copyright this because instead of those ugly square bike racks, you have to kind of fit the little wheels in between the little square, never quite wide enough rectangular bracket parts, and they look ugly, and there are always bikes chained to the outside of them because no one can actually get the stupid bike in it, and if you're the last guy in there, you're trying to get it. It's ridiculous. No one likes them. But they were just what bike racks looked like. Someone said, dude, we can do better. We're putting them on our street corners, and they made that pretty kind of curvy one. Whoa, it went, it's a court case. But they said that one, look, the whole thing is a bike rack. There's no sculpture or <coughs> sense of art that we can pull out of that that's not really just a bike rack. And if all you've got is a pretty bike rack, you can't come to the copyright office. You gotta have more pretty and less bike rack. You gotta have bleepers. <laughs> <laughs> There's another twist to them that's another easy question, which I can use my other prop. I, I like to pretend that I bring these in intentionally to use as educational things. Um, and we're just going to go with that as if it were true. Okay. It's my, there's a the theme. Um, really, I planned it in advance. I don't just own these things. Um, if I have a design on my practical item, which is actually practical because this can hold things, unlike the pony purse. Um, that design is easy. Again, this is the same concept. You walk through the same thing. But this is one of the easy cases. We don't even have to apply the separability test because, yeah, we get this one. This piece of artwork can be protectable because you can easily imagine artwork's gone. Now it's just a black satchel, right? That's the easy one. This is similar to the easy answer and what the Supreme Court ends up hinging on, which is you can get a copyright in the design of your fabric or oh say your hotel carpet <laughs> <laughs> so a fabric design is protectable but what you make that carpet into oh say a car or a ninja suit or a ball gown or, or a cult 
A cult, yes. Um, I, is a cult a it's called useful the cult, item? The cult of the carpet. Yeah, but is it, is it a useful item? Okay, I'm sorry. Very useful. This is how bad things happen in legal theory. That was a cult useful. Um, when you get three lawyers in a room, bad things start to happen. Especially if they're kind of strung out on the last day of Dragon Con, or even worse, a little bit relaxed on late Saturday night at Dragon Con, because that's why we don't get invited to parties, because we will start saying, hey, what about if you copyright the whole cult? Would that be a useful item? And we would do that. I'm ashamed to admit. It's not quite as shameful because I'm writing them out too. Okay. There you go. Separability. There's a lot of constantly confusing cases. And if you're a lawyer and you have find a case that helps your situation, that's the test you want to use. If you're arguing in court and you say, okay, well, I think if I use this particular description of which is the art and which is the function in this thing, I think that this will do me the best good. That's the test you think everyone should use. And one distinction that um, did come up sporadically based on what they were litigating was the idea of what's left behind when I break off this chunk of art. If uh, the Balinese sculpture, or in this case they talked about a little Siamese cat. Um, that was new to me. I'm like, oh, look, there's a Siamese cat too. Now it's like the Balinese dancer. I'm old, I don't like change, it frightens me. So I'm sticking with the Balinese dancer. If it's a sculpture of a dancer with a lamp growing out of the same floor that she's on, it's easy. I break the dancer off, the guy who owns the lamp's kind of pissed, and I have a lamp, I have a dancer. Yay. Not protected, protected. If she's the base of the lamp, and I separate her out, I haven't really left a lamp anymore. I've left shreds of wire and plastic, and now I have a sculpture. And some, some courts thought that mattered. If I'm physically separating, they liked to think that there was going to be a actual physical useful item over here and an actual something artistic over here. Well, with the beloved pony purse. Oh, I'm not actually being called here. Look, the pony purse. Um, <laughs> with the beloved pony purse, you can't really separate it and leave a purse behind I don't know how you would, it, but yeah, we can still in our brains without worrying about what's left after I separate the artistic merit from my purse, I'm not worried about really is there a purse left behind, because that's still okay, this is a purse and a pony, and we get that. But if you're a litigator, and this is a case where either you can or you can't leave the lamp functional behind you after you rip the art out of it, you care suddenly, because that makes your case better if you can convince the judge to use this test as opposed to what the other lawyer is trying to say, which is, we don't care if you can have a lamp left behind or not. The new rule is, we don't care if you have a lamp left behind or not. Yay, now you can sleep at night. But so basically, all of the tests accomplished the exact same thing. And it was the easy idea we started with, pony purse. Now with um, the place that's a little bit unexpected for most humans who don't actually think this is exciting and fun and interesting and stay up at night literally talking about I shouldn't admit everything in front of these people and we're on camera so it's even worse. Um, the um, one thing that's a little weird out of all of this and doesn't even seem like physical separability or conceptual separability because hey it isn't is the fact that there is no copyright in clothing. There are no copyrights in any fashion design and there are no copyrights even in those stunningly elaborate things that people wear here after dark. Um, I don't care how much you built out into the giant sea monster skirt with a parasol. Yeah, obviously there's way more creative effort in a lot of those things that you see the real honest to God cosplayers doing. Um, there's way more creative effort and art going into that than there was into this. Guess which one gets protected by the law? The basics on that is they have always said that clothing is functional. This was obviously written by men who think that clothing is functional. Um, but the idea is clothing is a useful item, and no matter how you pretty it up, it's still just a useful item. There are, in some of the case history of this, some really funny points where one of the judges, yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't the Supreme Court when it was one of the other ones, so it wasn't actually one of the Supreme Court justices, but you have a circuit court judge, and these are very smart senior people, with some exceptions, um, is actually going on about what it means to buy a prom dress. <laughs> I am assuming he has a daughter um, at prom age. I'm hoping he has a daughter at prom age 
because he was talking about why you would care about the placement of sequins and ruching and ruffles on your prom dress and talking about you buy it so that you know, so you like how you look and that you feel like you're going to prom. And I don't actually remember which guy even wrote that, but I of course have a vision of the stereotypical old grouchy white guy um, with the white hair and you know, stern old guy that doesn't have fun anymore if he ever did, writing about what it feels like to wear a prom dress. I'm a boring human, I have to amuse myself when I can, that amuse the daylights out of me. But they're talking about what the clothing does and why you're buying a prom dress. Well, okay, and then they finally got down to, yeah, we don't really care, it's all about buying a prom dress, but then you can argue whether the purpose of the prom dress is just to clothe your body, duh, it's not, or is it, does it have other purposes? These judges were also arguing, because the lawyers made them, over whether the cheerleading costumes have just the function of basically making sure the cheerleaders aren't naked, uh, <clears throat> Wicking away sweat, they mentioned that, and surviving the athletic maneuvers that the girls do in Or does it also include that fourth purpose of identifying the, ide the individual as a cheerleader for a particular team? That's useful. Why does this matter? It matters because if the color and the design, which identifies her as a cheerleader for a high school, matters, then that's pr then that's useful and then this design doesn't get copyrighted if you think oh a white version of that would be every bit as good which you can just see them thinking good lord people these are just cheerleaders why are we talking about this if you don't care about the color which these guys ultimately do not then they say fine you can have the design of the fabric we feel confident saying that and they probably did not think of the Marriott carpet um, we're <laughs> confident telling you you can have the fabric patterning but you can't have the design of the dress which is you know what what the law was when we started all this out, and guess what the law is now that we're done? You can have a copyright in the pattern of the fabric, but not in the um, design of the dress. So that we have changed nothing, except now I can't give my students a test and make them be able to recite all 18 <laughs> different meaningless cultural, um, conceptual separability tests. That's the only thing that has happened. The test is a little different. Because of now the new test that everyone has to follow because it's the Supreme Court and we all do what they say, usually, um, is because that's the rule and we have to follow the, newly ver the new version of this old rule. Um, some people will win that wouldn't have and some people will lose that wouldn't have based on whether you leave the lamp behind. And you know, different tests favor different facts. So now I, we can't fight about it. I did want to jump in because why, since, since Varsity won in this case, um, ostensibly, you know, I mean, one of the arguments that came up is that if they had just printed, if they had made the entire cheerleading uniform out of one piece of fabric that had the design free printed on it, and they basically origami that into a dress, yeah. then that would have been a fabric print copy. And that would have been protected. Right, but in this case, they find that the designs of the cheerleading uniforms were protected on Varsity's behalf. So, like, what was the legal reasoning that went? <laughs> Well, the, the idea came down to, I can well, draw it on a piece of paper. So the, 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 test, the test of, can I break the Balinese dancer off, and what am I left with if she's, if she's actually holding up the lamp shape, is no longer even a concern, because what the Supreme Court has come down to, and I think this does change the test a little bit, because it makes it the same test we've always had, but I think it makes it a much, much easier test to, to say that I've met is if I can draw it on a piece of paper, then it becomes protectable. And, and that's way easier than can I break off the Balinese dancer. So, and, and to be clear, only the part that I can draw on the paper becomes protectable, but that does broaden what I think is, is going to be protected in fashion. The reason is I, I work with a lot of, uh, of, of fashion companies. I actually, I actually represent a prom dress designer. And that prom dress designer, we, never had any thought that we could protect his designs. And we still probably can't, because they're all just one color with buff, with ruffles and, and, and what have you. But, Placement um, of sequins, dude, that's right. important. But, but yes. if we look around the room, like, there, I, have, I have Batman on my sweatshirt, right? I could clearly take the Batman logo off my sweatshirt and put it onto something else, a piece of paper or any other article. I can find a billion things with the Batman logo on it in the vendor's room, so that's clearly protectable. Graphic t-shirts were always sort of the design of your graphic t-shirt 
he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a piece of art. And that has always been something that we could conceive of as being protectable. That lady's black and white dress, I'm not sure that prior to this case, any of us would think... The yellow, the yellow black dress? What did I say? Black, 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 black and white. white. <laughs> Look, I only see in gray. <laughs> we have yes. learned something new about TJ. Yellow, yellow and black dress. That, 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 lady's, that lady's bumblebee dress. Um, the, I'm not sure that, that, that six months ago any of the three of us would have thought we could copyright that. If one of us did, we'd argue about it. Oh, yeah. And don't get me wrong, we'll still argue about it. But I think after this, after this test, I can easily say I can draw black and yellow bars and then a wide black... Oh, Yellow, yellow. <laughs> white, yellow bottom where the skirt is, and draw this dress design and protect that work. I'm going to ask, though, how much protection do you actually have there? Because, well, I, I yeah. mean, copyright standards for originality, what the creative, the level of creativity are really, really low, but there still has to be something. And since the parts that make that outfit distinctive are the fashion design to it, not the fabric design to it, not the pattern. Mm -hmm. The parts that make that distinctive are excluded. Right. So we're right. just so, talking about the color and the placement of the color on the fabric. And I don't know that anyone's going to let you own stripes, although I swear to God these cheerleader uniforms are not that interesting. Right. Uh, when I was first reading this, for instance, the way the judges were describing the color placement of the color blocks and chevrons, I mean, I remembered what cheerleader uniforms looked like when I was in high school, um, and they were exactly what Meredith just described. A little bit of trim color, and then maybe a big V, and maybe not, and that's about it. And I was thinking, well, obviously these are the new modern cheerleading uniforms. They probably cover a tenth as much skin as ours did, and they probably are very strange, you know, big blocky colors, something modern and new looking. And no, I swear to God, these look just like they did when I was in high school. It is um, difficult for me to imagine what actually is covered here because it's a red dress with blue and white trim around the hem and the neck, and that's it. So to bring this back to cosplay, which is kind of the MO, I mean, a lot of this is, again, this is not a case about cosplay, but it no. is kind of a case about cosplay. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the, I wrote a big blog post about this when it was first appealed up to the Supreme Court, and a lot of the pushback we got was, oh, this is about cheerleader uniforms. It's like, well, yes, think like a lawyer, though. Uh, <laughs> it's it can apply, it's new law. Please don't think like a lawyer all the time. Um, it's not a good way to think. Uh, but yeah, so you can, you can generalize these things out to cosplay. So to sort of bring it back to that, if you think about uh, you've got this whole spectrum of like sort of fashion creativity on display with cosplay. On one end, you have uh, like the brown coats. Okay, so Firefly, where you've got a trench coat, and that's kind of it. Um, Maybe cap. Or you, could do, that trench coat. you could do, and I will say this, costume. as a Twin Peaks fan who has not seen the last two episodes, do not say anything to me about them, because um, I could not get showtime in my hotel room. Um, so on one end you have Agent Dale Cooper, who is in a black suit with a white shirt and a black tie and a trench coat. And maybe if you're being really cute and making some in-jokes, you carry around a mug of coffee all the time. Uh, someone was actually doing this yesterday, and I'm pretty sure no one knew that he was cosplaying except for like two people. So. <laughs> That's one end of the creativity spectrum. You would almost certainly not be able to get any, in a hypothetical world where you you sort of, you could get a copyright in, let's just assume you could get a copyright by the originality of the design. So it's not entirely clear that that's how that's actually gonna play out with this case, but let's live in that world. So that's one end of the spectrum. On the other hand, you have something like Mercy from Overwatch, where you have a very intricate bodysuit uh, you've got a lot of accessories, and the accessories get a little weird because then you get into the, is it clothing or is it wearable sculpture? Uh, if you have a prop gun, that's probably close to the wearable sculpture. If you have a pair of mechanical wings, then it starts to get into wearable sculpture, maybe? Um, you know, and it, it, you, so you run the gamut. The point is that you run the gamut. Um, and that's a good thing. Like, I'm happy to talk about why that's a good thing, but the fact that, you know, you should not really be able to get a copyright in the uniform of Special Agent Dale Cooper uh, with his black suit and tie, or, or you know, Fox Mulder, if, for those of you who haven't watched Twin Peaks, um, same thing. Like, that should not be copyrightable. When you get into something really wacky and out there, like the Overwatch characters, like, that's probably going to make a much stronger case for our copyright protection. Um, and so that's kind of where we exist right now. I think, I think the TLDR is that it's not a whole lot clearer than it was before we had this case. 
Um, if we use, we will now use different words to explain the same, the same idea, thing. and it's still going to come down to the same thing, which is okay. Do you just see a purse, or do you see a piece of sculpture? And if so, which parts of that should be protected? And just keep in mind the one big chunk of this that still is true is that the stuff that we see as costumes and, and high fashion has the same issue. A lot of people spend a lot of money making fashion and there are still New York shows and catwalks and all of that stuff. Um, and none of that is protected by copyright, which surprises people the first time they hear it because that certainly seems like the artsy creative stuff that's usually smack dab in the middle of copyright law. You don't even have to stretch to get there. And this but is this is hugely economically important, by the way, that fashion is not protected by copyright. There's a lot of money on both sides if, of that question. If you walk into a Forever 21, or an H&M, or a Gap, that's fast fashion. Their entire business model is seeing what comes down the runway that we can reasonably replicate very fast and at very low cost and sell en masse to the consumers. That is a huge section of the fashion, the fashion economy. Now, there's kind of like a detente that has existed between these two camps for a very long time. Um, you know, once in a blue moon, you'll get high fashion houses that will go push in Congress and be like, "We need a fashion copyright bill," and that never really goes anywhere. But it happens reliably they every like ten years or every so. Every cycle, every now and again, they feel, "Wait, we haven't done this recently." Yeah. They try they again. Everyone gets excited. The lobbyists buzz around. They talk about how important it is that. You can't steal our designs. Our designs are better than other copyrighted stuff. Why aren't we in here? It's not fair. And usually some of the Congress folks get in on board, and then they finally say, you know, we've never done this. We're still not doing this. Go away. And then the gap shows up, and they're like, do you know who I am? And it, then it all just, it just stops. Because um, the arguments on both sides are fairly good at the end of the day, unless you're on one of those sides. Um, yeah. And Congress doesn't care, and they Every time a new one comes up, you'll hear about why this law is going to pass, why this bill is going to be a good one to protect fashion, and the other does. Yeah. It goes away. And we're right back where we started. So With that's all the, the that's background uh, info. So I wanted to open it up to questions, because I know this is a super thorny topic, and as evidenced, we could, in fact, talk about this for hours, because uh, that's what we do. So, like, yeah, time for, time for questions. Here you go. Oh. I, I trust the judgment of Dr. Sharpie. the first one with the hand up. <laughs> We're waiting for the box to work. Oh. Testing, testing. There we go. Um, smoke for that. <clears throat> Isn't this, though, uh, a commercial problem? If I see something and I build my own costume of it, that's personal use. Isn't this really only if I'm trying to replicate a pattern or a design for commercial sale on profit that this really comes from? Not necessarily. So I think what you're probably thinking of, and this is a good time to talk about fair use. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go through the whole litany. That's another like whole hour long. Idea for panel next year. Fair use. What it actually is versus what you think it means. Um, because that would be, that could just be a total track for all I care. Um, so, wrong. Basically, people, whatever you, then we whatever you think is wrong, and this includes if you're a lawyer, what you think is probably wrong. Um, so the the idea of fair use is that there are certain uses of copyright material that we have decided historically and as a society and, and eventually codified in law that, you know, yes, you are in fact using someone else's copyrighted material, but we're okay with that. Uh, and there's a handful of tests that there's a handful of like factors that determine when we're okay with that. Um, none of those factors is determinative, so no one of those factors will tip it one way or the other. Certain judges have priorities for some over the other, but there's really all things, they should all be equal factors. So one of the things that come up is, I'm not making any money off of this, so it should be fine. And that's actually not true. Uh, whether or not, the way that this is baked into the fair use test is actually, are you creating basically what's called a market substitute? So if, the, the example I like to use is if you make a really high quality Captain America shield, uh, Marvel, aka Disney, uh, makes a lot of those. And even if they don't, that's a really obvious toy market for them to get into. They don't actually have to be making it right now. They have to like, you know, reasonably have the expectation that they might want to make it at some point. Um, if you're selling en masse really high quality Captain Marvel shields, that's a problem. You're creating a market substitute. You're basically pushing them out of something that they could be selling later on. 
Um, and that's kind of how the money thing factors into it. So as a purely legal matter, the fact that you're not making any money off of it, it's a, just a personal use and a one-off, doesn't actually really matter. Uh, it, it kind of factors into it a little bit, but it's not determinative. On a practical level, if you're not making money off of it, chances are no one's going to notice. Um, and you're going to fly under the radar. But if you made tons and tons of them and were giving them away, the harm to Disney would still be there, right. and therefore that would be disallowed. If you just made one, I mean, part of it is it's not, you may not even be doing something that would be a fair use, but we'll never know because they won't see, they won't care. Right. But if you're giving a lot of them away, they may see, well, they see everything. It's the mouse. They know. They're listening now. <laughs> yeah. All hail the mouse. Um, yeah, and so the they know, but they just don't care. Um, if you do enough that they care, that's when they start to sue. And fair, another thing about fair use is that it's not really fair use until the judge says so at the end of the trial. And so you get into a certain amount of practical how much justice can you afford. Because it costs a lot of money to pay guys like him to get you to the point where the judge says it's fair use and you're allowed to have done what you've already done. And if you lose, then you owe Disney money, probably a lot because their lawyers are really good. If you win, you owe, you, a you owe him a lot of money. Yeah. And so mo a lot of people who would do something like that are quelled or have a really bad wake up when they pay him a lot of money. Um, because even if you were right, it still costs an awful lot of money to get the judge to say you were right. Yeah. And I don't mean paying the judge directly. I'm that cynical enough without saying that. that's where that's coming from. You're paying him to convince the judge. And I'll pay the judge. <laughs> TJ, that's what you say on the inside. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 right. The inside <laughs> looks. Right. Well, you know, the, the, the funny thing about Cosmo, just to follow up on that for a second, is that, and we haven't even talked about the trademark implications and all the other things that come around. That's, the, that's, Captain that's America is, is trademarked. Captain America is also a copyright protected character. So, so, so there's l layers upon layers. So, so you could be infringing multiple <laughs> types of intellectual property with your costume, but it's sort of bad business to sue your big fan. So if you're dressed up as Captain America because you really, really love Captain America, Marvel probably doesn't want to say, hey, fuck you, I'm going to sue you. Take that Captain America stuff off and burn all your comic books because now you hate us. Yeah, so it's, it's a way to, it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of a, self-correcting mark. Now, again, if you start selling or even giving away your great Captain America costumes, then they probably have a, a problem with you, but dressing up and coming to Dragon Con or Comic Con or any of those other things... Even they not, aren't stupid yeah, enough to sue you. You don't bite the hand that buys you really expensive stuff. Uh, but there is an extension to that. There are some cases that are out there, of course, because if there's a if it happens, there's a lawyer. Um, <laughs> if you put on that Captain America suit that you made, and you walk around Dragon Con, Disney's going to say, great, another fan, he'll come to the movies. We can keep making them even long after they're good. You'll keep buying tickets. Yay. Okay. But if you wear that same costume and start renting yourself out to kids' birthday parties, the lawyers come knocking. Because now, even though it's the same suit, you're not replicating that suit. You're not wearing You're not... Um, selling it to people, you're not hitting their market at all, but now you're in a different situation and that's where they will say, okay, no, now that's not okay. Yeah, and so what you do problem. and how you do it, there's lots of different ramifications of it. Just sniff tests all around. You know, like yeah, if it seems like, okay, this should be an official costume, it probably should. Okay. Next question. I have a question about international law. Um, I am curious to hear the panel's thoughts on what the implications are for other countries and if they do uh, similar tests to the ones that have been described in the Supreme Court case. So I can only, so I know a little bit about Japanese copyright law and that's kind of the only other one I can really speak to. Um, <coughs> Japanese copyright law does not have anything analogous to fair use. Uh, they actually, Japanese copyright law is, is on lockdown, essentially. It's, it's pretty strict, which is funny because then you have things like Kamiket uh, and, and Dojinshi, which are, so for anyone who's not a giant weeb like I am, um, it's, uh, basically there is, in the, the Japanese comic scene, a lot of folks get their start by doing fan comics of other works, um, and there is a massive market for these. Uh, Kamiket, which happens twice every year, uh, where they're just, they rent out, like, I think the Tokyo Convention Center, and just open air, there's police 
providing security for the thing, people are buying and selling these infringing fan comics just out in the open. These comics are clearly against the law. There's not a fair use argument. Absolutely. Fans. And a lot of them purely are Purely illegal. A lot of them are a lot of porn. Um, <laughs> One of the superheroes is Rape Man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this stuff is purely illegal. There's no argument there with fair use, as she's saying. It's just there, wrong, and yet... There is, a, however, there is a social a concept. There's a social concept called Anmoku no Ryokai, which means the tacit consent, which is this idea for the social relationship between creators and their fans. And it's, it's not baked into the law, but it is very much a way of thought about Japanese media consumption. It's this idea that there's a personal relationship between the creator and their fans. Um, it's also helped by the fact that a lot of these folks who do these fan comics then go on to become big names in doing their own titles. Um, so a lot of them come up through that way. Um, but there is, however, interestingly, a person, as of 2006, I have not looked this up in the last decade, which is sad, but um, there is a dude who maintains the blacklist of things that you do not draw doujinshi of under any circumstances. The top, I'll, I'll give you one guess at the top company's properties. Ghibli? Disney. You do not draw no Jinchi of Disney because they will litigate. They will sue your ass. There is no tacit consent there at all. So that's um, more of a cultural, not that it's legal, but that we would right. like not to sue. It's a cultural norm, not a legal one. Yeah, um, and and the second one is Nintendo. <laughs> uh, Nintendo and Pokemon specifically. In fact, the only lawsuit, again, this is this is 10 years out of date, which is when I wrote the paper on this, but... Um, the only lawsuit that had ever been levied in Japan against the Dojinchi was against a Pokemon porn. Uh, and Nintendo came after that guy hard and he ended up doing jail time. Wow. So, do not, do not fuck with Nintendo. Is, uh, <laughs> they are the Japanese Disney in a lot of, on a lot of fronts. Um, so that's the only one I can really speak to. I do know that on the international trade level, we have a problem where uh, whenever we go into international trade agreements, we tend to try to export all these strong arm protections of American copyright law. And we conveniently forget to say that maybe they should implement something that kind of looks like their names. Uh, weirdly enough, the TPP, before it got scrapped, was actually the best for IP law that we've ever tried to enter into. Uh, because the TPP actually said, yeah, you should export, like, you should take all these really strong protections for IP creators, but also, like, you should absolutely adopt fair use and other consumer protections that exist in American copyright law. We tried to export those for, like, the first time in recorded history. Um, and then that got scrapped, so... Never mind. Maybe next yeah. time. There we go. Um, I have kind of a, a question, a statement. How does this uh, ruin or affect, like, duct tape dresses for the prom when duct tape is putting out a um, competition to make the dress out of, or suit out of duct tape? Um, it, it begins being the brown dresses. Um, why am I These a prom dress? These are extra prom dresses. I'm just There's your cosplay for next time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll help with the safe placement. <laughs> Better not have a chevron on it. Um, <laughs> Better bring whiskey before you take it. <laughs> so, the, 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 a, a, as we've said a couple times, nothing about the shape of the prom dress is, is anything you're going to protect. So it doesn't matter whether it's got a wide skirt or a narrow skirt, or puppy sleeves or no sleeves. It, it's going to have it, whatever the shape of the dress is, is completely not copyrightable. So the, the, the only thing that would be copyrightable is the design, if anything, on the dress, even after this current case. So design on the dress, the not design, the design of the right, dress. Right, the design itself. So if, if, I had a, if I had a prom dress that had big blocks of color and chevrons like a cheerleader uniform, which would be, God, an atrocious prom dress. Yeah. Um, They're not really nice looking cheerleaders. <laughs> most prom dresses are not but so so if if I had those big blocks of color or those big designs or or, or black and yellow stripes, I could conceivably conceivably uh, protect that and stop you from making a black and yellow striped duct tape dress. But if you just took some silver duct tape and made a dress out of it, there is nothing copyright about copyrightable about that in the slightest. There was not for this case. There's not after the case. The only thing that may have been added into what we can protect is we'll go back. Sorry. We're, when you come to one of our panels, you're going to get picked on. The yellow and black outfit, maybe, in the past, since it wasn't one piece of fabric with a pattern on it, you got nothing. Now, maybe the color, overall color design of that outfit might be, they'll take more cases to figure that out, 
on if it's replicatable or not. Um, might be protectable, but of course the next question is, well, what if I do slightly narrower or slightly wider? And that's where the court's going to say, seriously, it's black and white or black and yellow stripes. We're not going to give you any protection except an exact copy of that. Go home, <coughs> drunk. Go home, make the stripes a quarter of an inch wider, and you're good. Yeah, you, one interesting thing to take away from this case is that while the court has given us the test we're supposed to use, the Supreme Court has now said, no, 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 we don't want 11 of what are essentially the same tests, but have very, very different applications, and everybody's going to argue about them. We have one test, and here's the one test. Go home. But they didn't actually say, and that makes varsity stuff protected. They didn't actually rule on the copyrightability of those particular designs or how much of those designs would be protected. They said these could be protected because you can draw them. They did draw them. That drawing can be protectable. What of that can you infringe? Probably an exact copy of that, which in cheerleading uniforms is critical because if I'm going to make a cheerleading uniform for a school, I want it to be an exact copy right. of Varsity's. So Varsity has the protection that Varsity wants, but can I make another cheerleading uniform for another school that also uses blocks of colors and chevrons in different widths of chevrons and different blocks of color? Probably yeah. so. You probably still can. So there's not, I don't, I, I'm sure there will be lots of new cases as people try to do what Varsity did. There's another academic element there too, and I want to make sure that this doesn't get lost, when they were kind of bullying the copyright office into finally saying, fine, we'll register that if you'll go away, it was a picture of the design. and. If I get out my camera and take a picture of TJ's clothes right now, I own the copyright in that photograph. I have no rights whatsoever to what the photograph is of. So if I were to register a photograph of a dress design, it's copyrightable, but my photograph is the only thing protected. The design in the photo, what I took a picture of is irrelevant. Um, there's a famous painting of old shoes. And the you know I can the co the painting is copyrighted. The painter had absolutely no right to any pair of shoes or to keep anyone from making shoes that look just like the shoes in the painting. This actually comes up, and I, I just kind of want to and like put an end cap on that, which is um, it. And this this is something I think a lot about in terms of cosplay is like what is the medium, the original medium that you're cosplaying from? If it's from film, then there is like there is a real version of of Harrison Ford's coat from Blade Runner. Like someone has made that, you can buy official copies of it. Um, if you're cosplaying from an anime, where it's always been a 2D representation of a piece of clothing that never really existed, does that implicate the, does that implicate the, you know, it has always been drawn on paper. I right. Mean, that, by definition, you can draw, I don't know, Asuna's coat from uh, Sword Art Online, like, you can draw that on paper. It's always been drawn on something. Um, so that might, Does know. that mean that, the, but then we step, jump into um, copyright of characters. Right. Yeah. Which is like a whole other just giant, you know. So you can go full, well, okay. I don't have enough caffeine. We're not going to talk about that jacket, but we're going to talk about that character, and we know who he is because of that jacket. Yep. That's a whole different one. Seriously, it's a whole weekend. Yeah, God, we could be here forever. There would be we only no have like five minutes left. In this room. Technically, so I do want to get through a couple more questions. If I put on a Captain America costume and rent myself out a party, I could get into trouble. What if I rent a booth downstairs and sell photo prints of myself dressed as Captain America, as we see the cosplayers do? Uh, I think it just depends on whose property you're cosplaying and sort of what their good will is at the time. Captain America. Well, right. So, I mean, that's, again, I don't it think there's a... It is an infringement. It think. is an infringement. Whether or not anyone is... Whether or not it could conceivably count as a fair use is still kind of like eh. Once you're selling, the, the photograph of the costume is a derivative work of the costume. Here's your legal answer. And a derivative work is an infringement unless you have permission or you own the copyright. Some derivative works, which are all infringements, are also a fair use, in which case, even though it would otherwise have been illegal, it's okay. And some things the owners just don't care about. Um, and when we're saying that might be okay, what we're really saying is it might be a fair use, but remember it's expensive to find out, or they might not care. The threshold question is very clear, yes, that's an infringement. Right. Yeah. Okay. Does that... The, the I, I think this made it more confusing, I'm sorry. But, huh? What was your last point, the threshold? The, the basic question of, is this okay? In well, a purely legal In a universe. purely legal academic world, no, that's an infringement, unless we make the fair use argument. In a practical level, a lot of times they don't care. But I think when you start selling pictures of it, right. then they're then more they likely to find out and they're more likely to care. Start to care. Yeah. The, 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 
take away from that, that the threshold you can get. Fair use, you've got to remember, fair use is I'm infringing you, but it's okay. It doesn't make it not infringing. It means that my infringement, I'm going to get away with. Mm -hmm. So from a, from a practical perspective, every fair use is an infringement. Yes. It's just an okay infringement. So you're definitely infringing. It might be fair use if you want to pay me to find out. It definitely probably isn't going to get you sued unless you really start making a lot of money or get a lot of attention or do something that might otherwise harm the brand. If you're Captain America with no pants on and you're selling pictures of pantsless Captain America, you'll get a note from Disney. Oh, no. you won't get a note. The guys in the dark suits with the little ears are going to be not going to tell you. We won't see you at the next panel. Um, could uh, the panel speak to the differences between Justice Thomas's uh, opinion and Ginsburg's concurrence? Ginsburg was smoking. <laughs> well, I read that and said, holy cow. Ginsburg, I will give a, a piece of context. Ginsburg's daughter is a sort of a copyright maximalist. She's an academic who writes a lot about copyright and is very like all copyright all the time forever. Um, that's, that's kind of an unfair characterization, but as someone who definitely places herself on the copy left, that's kind of how we treat her. Teach out of her um, sometimes. I, and, I, and I love the notorious RBG, but she is my problematic fave when it comes to copyright stuff. So I can't speak to, it's been a while since I actually like went through a rental decision, which is a bad thing to admit when I'm moderating the panel. <laughs> Well, the, 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 the general the general issue was she had even less of a test than the majority. Yeah, she the, was going to make it worse, and she didn't right. make sense either. The, the, the majority basically said, you have to be able to at least create a real representation of this somewhere else. You have to be able to make a 2D representation of the graphics on a piece of paper. You have to be able to paint a picture of the, of the design and still have the design be a graphical work. Ginsburg just basically said, ah! If the dress has a design on it, it's a design. We're copywriting. Well, I mean, she so. said that it wasn't useful at all. And I'm like, it's clothes. Yes, it is. We know right. that. That's the rule. I don't know if she was really trying to say now all clothing design should be covered. I wasn't quite sure if she said the co And she was sort of saying that the copyright is only in the photograph of the design, which is kind of the, if I take a picture of you, I can have the photograph. Um, copyright doesn't mean that what I took the picture of is copyrighted. And she may have just been saying, oh, it's not even an issue. We don't have to talk about it because it's just the drawing that's been copyrighted. It doesn't even relate to the dress, so we don't have to decide it. But it was not her yeah, was best good. moment. Well, sure. Another interesting takeaway, though, from, from my perspective, because I do think that this is going to create work for me. Oh, yeah. Plus. Every time there's uh, a new case. But the, the dissent, the dissent kind of hit the nail on the head in terms yeah. of that, right? Because the was good. as of now, well, as of six months ago, I think most of my fashion clients thought very little of our work is, is copyrightable. We're not going to try to sue people. And we're not going to worry about people who are suing us. Right. And whether or not my clients want to go sue more people, I hope they do. Um, I do think that this is going to create a situation where a lot more fashion designers are going to get cease and desist letters or even copyright litigation from other people who have some type of similar design or pattern. And it, it sort of opens up that door for uh, what none of us before would have thought as, as, as separable from the usual <coughs> article um, into something that now likely we are going to see. It, you're right. I don't know what the answer is. I think maybe. But I think we're going to take a lot more litigation to figure that out. And, and that's going to be the... My guess would be, and I'm not a litigator, so tell me if my kind of instinct on this is right, is that you know, for a short period of time you're going to get a lot of those cases and because other people are saying, really? They could knock their competition out of the market with copyright lawsuits? Sweet! Let's get us a lawyer and do it. And there's going to be a lot of very predatory sorts of anti-market um, lawsuits, which is exactly where this all started, um, was the vast empire of PEP trying to smash its competitors using this and other um, things. But I think you're going to have more people trying that and say, hey, work for them, let's give it a try, let's race to the bottom. And then when we figure out for sure what the exact rules are going to be, then they'll all settle back down because we'll know again what the rule is. Right. And you'll have to wait for someone else to make an opinion before and they come back And in the meantime, to you'll just have a lot of us copyright policy wonks just screaming right. incoherently in the distance. It's this all happening. We'll listen right. to each well, other. It'll be a catch of muffled screaming. Well, here's, here, here, here's how it really is going to work. We're going to have, we're going to have a ton of, we're going to have a, a literal ton of cease and desist letters sent that most of which will get ignored. Right. Somebody will actually sue. Many somebody's will probably actually sue. And it will take years until some 
some court of appeals actually rules to give us some guidance on what that would apply, because that's the only place precedent is made. So we will have three or four or five years before anything gets to a point where we can say there's something with a precedential effect. <laughs> So and TJ's getting a new car. We'll be busy before we can years. actually actually okay. all honestly say we get it now. And yeah. eventually we'll say, oh, okay, that's the rule, <laughs> and then we'll go back to where we were. Yep. So I think that's the end of the. So we're out of time. Um, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, if you have any other questions, I know some folks had some we didn't get to, so feel free to come up and let us.